So, uh, good morning, everyone. We have with us uh, Ms. Tara Krishnaswamy. Uh, she is a feminist who is working towards uh, uh, the Women Reservation Bill. So, I wanted to ask a few questions to her about uh, her experiences as a feminist and uh, what she is working for um, and uh, what is her message to the young generation. So, hello, ma'am. Um, Hi, good morning. Good morning. So, my first question is, uh, what encouraged you to become a feminist? Uh, what is it that drives you to lead the fight for women inclusion in the legislature? Um, from a very young age, I've uh, always looked around and felt that there is a, a lot of differences uh, between various sections of society. You see people uh, on the street, children who uh, may be begging and not have enough to eat. Um, you see people uh, who may be handicapped and uh, you know in poverty. You see people living in slums and you contrast that with houses that others live in. So I felt that there is a lot of um, inequality in our society. And one of the biggest sections of people that are unequal are women. Um, women are uh, you know, from before they are born in India, we have a patriarchal system where, uh, you know, there is feticide even before the child is born. There is infanticide after the girl child is born. And very few um, girls actually make it through birth, through uh, school, and even get to college, right? If, you, if you're a girl who makes it to college, if you're a woman who's graduated college, you are, you know, maybe 40% of uh, uh, the overall number of girls that have been conceived and, uh, you know, so it's um, not even 40%, you're probably 20%. So it is uh, very apparent that women are poorer, less educated, they are less fed, they're not given the most nutritious food or given the best opportunities. So uh, I've been guided by a great sense of equality. And that is true for oppressed castes. That is true for, um, you know, uh, certain communities or even religions. Minority religions are on average poorer and less educated. So I firmly believe that it is the state's job and society's job to give those of us that have need to give to make the state a more equal, more better place, make society a more harmonious place for everyone. Thank you, ma'am. So uh how did your journey as a feminist start uh was there an event that pushed you towards it um i i i can't pinpoint one single event but from a very uh you know much much younger than you for example when i first started reading the newspaper i found that reports of uh, harassment of women you know rapes and gruesome incidents disturbed me tremendously. It is something that uh, I couldn't take and it would uh, make me very, uh, at that young age, very angry and very upset um, about the goings on. And the fact that I never saw reports in the newspaper of the follow-up and the fact that people were caught and punished in a timely manner and justice was served. So this is something that weighed in on my mind to the point that at some point I stopped reading newspapers, you know. And then uh, when I um, was in my high school, I started volunteering at that time. There was an NGO close to home and because it was close to home, um, it was working with uh, people who are uh, potential HIV patients. Uh, there are people whose line of work is such that they are more susceptible to HIV like sex workers. And the NGO, the people in the NGO would go and educate them about safe sex practices, about using condoms and things like that. And I would accompany them as a high school girl uh, to go see how these things are. And uh, that is when my eyes really opened to, as these conversations were happening with the sex workers and we were telling them about the importance of, uh, uh, you know, using a condom to prevent HIV spread. Um, that is when they would tell us that, look, even if we try to ask a customer to do that, uh, we would get beat up. Right. So that's when I realized the, the women don't have agency to make change. Women who came into the NGO as domestic violence victims would then want to go back because they have no other form of livelihood. Their children are stuck in that marriage. Right. So uh, these are all connected in a vicious cycle. If you don't make women economically independent, if you don't make women socially independent and politically powerful, then it becomes these these are connected and they become vicious and women are unable to escape that social oppression 
without economic independence. And then they are unable to become economic in the economically independent because they are socially oppressed and they're not allowed to go to work and earn well. So because this is so interconnected is when my eyes opened that really working on giving, making sure that women's agency, women's autonomy, women's right to decision making and a right to a life, um, happiness in life is not snatched away by society and patriarchy and the state and even the politics of it. And you can call that feminism. Uh, I, I love it that it's called feminism. It's also a fight for justice and equality and rights. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so, could you give me a brief overview of the Women Reservation Bill? Um, the Women's Reservation Bill is, first of all, not the only thing that we are looking at. So, Shakti is a citizens group, and we are working on getting more women MLAs and MPs across parties. We're a nonpartisan group. So, one way to do that is through the Women's Reservation Bill, where a certain number of seats are reserved in state legislatures and in the union legislature for women. But that is not the only way. And in fact, that is the last resort. Um, if you look at uh, schools, right? If you look at the education sector, uh, uh, awareness for sending girls to schools started way back in the 50s and the 40s and the 60s. So you have more and more and more girls going to school, right? And if you look at the employment sector, there is also more awareness of uh, making sure that women are economically independent. Not enough, but it is there, right? But if you look at the political sector, making sure that women are part of political parties, women hold decision-making positions in political parties, women are able to rise through the party framework, and then women are able to contest elections, win those elections, and make decisions and policies that change the state and change the country. Right? Those are also very important. For example, when the GST tax was introduced, they levied a 16% tax on sanitary napkins. Whereas the tax on, you know, bindis and bangles and Coca-Cola was far less than that, right? Even after one year that hadn't changed. And after two years when it changed, again, when the COVID lockdown came, they didn't add sanitary napkins to the essential commodities list. The reason that things like this happen is not because there is one woman and two women. You need to have a critical mass of women. Just like when you go into a classroom, you want to see 50% girls in that class, right? Because 50% of society is women. Just like when you walk into a bank or when you walk into a company, you see that you want to see the same thing with politics. So there are many ways of bringing women into politics by uh, working with political parties to make sure that they create a space that welcomes women a space that is not misogynistic. They field female candidates so that the voters have a choice of male and female candidates. So Shakti works on all of this stuff and on the Women's Reservation Bill. And the Women's Reservation Bill is if the parties don't field enough women, if we don't have enough women in states and parliament, like today, where we have very, very few women, we have 9% women on average in the states, and we have 14% of women in parliament, then one way to accomplish it is to say, let us reserve some of the constituencies in the state. Let us say half the constituencies or one third the constituencies, a number can be debated. But the point is women are half the population, right? So there must be a critical mass of women. So at least a third of the seats must be reserved. Ideally, 50% of the seats must be reserved so that must automatically be eligible so that women can contest there and win. If the parties don't create a framework, if society doesn't create a framework for such political equality, we are forced to look at reservation. Yes, ma'am. Um, one of the questions that I have is, um, what satisfies you the most being a feminist? Um, I don't think it's a conscious decision to say, you know, this is satisfying, so I do it, right? Um, you know how you're uh, going on the street and it's a hot day and you see some ice cream, it's intuitive, you want to have the ice cream or you see someone who's hurt, you want to help, right? There are human qualities, I think, in all of us. And sometimes um, we don't nurture some of those qualities. Uh, society and then the upbringing doesn't allow us to nurture some of those empathetic qualities. So I think the most satisfying thing about uh, fighting for the underdog, 
uh, fighting for women who are often the underdogs, fighting for less privileged people, fighting for the marginalized, is that, uh, is that it allows you to nurture your own empathy and your humanism, right? It's the most human quality to, to uh, help those in need. So I think there is, a, there is an immense degree of satisfaction because we are doing the right thing. And it's also guilt, I think, that you know, some of us in society have, have had much more opportunity than others. So I think it's, it's very satisfying because even beyond helping individuals, I think you're doing the right thing for the country. The country is usually benefited when women come forward and hold important positions. Um, a society needs to have a variety of talent making decisions for it. It is not a question of, uh, you know, uh, why are we always looking at things through gender lens or why are we always looking at things through a caste lens? Um, it's as simple as this. If, you're, if you live in a house, say there are 20 houses on the street, everybody needs to have a chance to say uh, how the garbage should be managed you know, where the street, light sh uh, street lights should be, whether the park that is a common property, you know, uh, what hours it should be open, right? Everybody has a stake in it because it belongs to the community. Same way the nation belongs to everybody in the nation and everybody should have a stake in it. And when you have a situation where for 70 years, 90%, 95% of the decision-making is in the hands of men and men alone, older generation of men, upper caste men, then we are not including all the possible talent. And it is our job to make sure that talent has an opportunity to be included. The talent doesn't have an opportunity to be included, maybe because the society is not allowing women to come forward. Maybe because we are preventing women from pursuing their ambition. Maybe because it's not safe on the streets for women. Maybe because women are poorer. So all of this needs to be addressed. And I think the most satisfying thing is to make sure that the country includes more and more talent that can therefore improve, you know, the human development of the country, the progress of the country, the economy of the country. Uh, Mom, why do you think that this patriarchal system has developed over time, uh, whether it is in India or uh, around the world in various countries? Uh, like, why do you think uh, women are discouraged in certain fields of uh, career? Um, do you think that gender equality should be emphasized on during education? Absolutely. I think gender equality starts at home on the day, uh, you know, there are every home for the most part has both genders. And uh, gender equality begins at home on day number one. There is no doubt about it. In fact, I can say that I was raised in a feminist household. So in a sense, I didn't need to wake up to, uh, oh my God, the genders are equal. I was raised that way. My parents were that way. For the most part, my grandparents were that way for their generation. So I think I was blessed in that sense. But gender equality, certainly the family and the school and the educational system has a great role to play in it. And making sure that our boys are raised right becomes much more important than the way the girls are raised. How many boys, uh, you know, come forward and hold programs like this or listen to programs like this, right? So that is amazing. The fact that you're doing it and the fact that, uh, you know, any, any of the boys that are listening to it, that's amazing. It is not because it's a women's issue. That is the misunderstanding, uh, right? Feminism is not a women's issue. Feminism is a social issue. Rape is not a women's issue. It's a law and order issue. The fact that you live in a society where these things happen affects everybody because your society is not as rich as it can be. Your society is not as, uh, uh, you know, accommodative of talent. Your society is not utilizing all the available uh, talent, right? Your society, therefore, is not progressing as much as it can. So when you walk out, sometimes when children, uh, uh, you know, go to a foreign country from India, they say, um, Amma, why is everything so bright and shiny and clean and so beautiful, right? Uh, that's what strikes them, right? And the reason that it's that way is because people on average are much more civic conscious and also more well-to-do. The more the differences in society that you have, great inequalities that you have, the more you're going to see that it is difficult to progress, right? 
because the last person standing in the line the poorest individual the remotest village unless it has electricity unless it has awareness unless it has infrastructure the the last woman in the line right the the up, most oppressed caste until everybody is educated and has opportunities the country can't progress right and when 50% of the population doesn't have the same opportunities as the other 50% within any caste within any religion even in the uppermost privileged classes the woman is less privileged than the man right so when you have a situation like that then the nation can't progress so we need to have education and awareness uh, not in one or two places in every possible sector for example at home in schools colleges every uh, public sector company every company needs to go through quarterly gender sensitization programs if you look at the company in which i work every quarter we go through gender sensitization even if you're a woman or a man you go through gender sensitization right how to treat people right what kinds of things when you say are sexist comments or put down you're hiring somebody are you allowed to say she is pregnant i'm not going to hire her things like that are even against the law and people do it very easily so this kind of uh, gender sensitization needs to start early needs to sustain through your education and through your employment days and especially for the politicians and inside political parties as well yes ma'am so uh, after listening to what you said uh, i feel that there have been uh, many stereotypes which have been uh, pushed upon women uh, such that uh, for example um woman homemaker father uh, uh, or man breadwinner uh, i think it should be taught to boys when they are young also that both genders are equal both have the right to do whatever they are interested in and they have a, they have the capability to do so i think that's something that can uh, have a major impact very well said actually you talked about the roots of patriarchy i think the roots of patriarchy are deeply connected to the bodily functions of women and the fact that women go through the reproductive process and are responsible for birthing children uh, uh, you know so uh, society doesn't think beyond that um, and has relegated them to that exclusive role right just because you you have to remember that every human being plays multiple roles in life the man who is the ceo of the biggest company is also a father is also a brother right uh, when he drives a car he is a driver right if he makes himself a cup of tea he is a cook right so nobody plays a singular role in life but women are very often relegated to um, you know uh, parenting and uh, cooking and cleaning right so that is a uh, i think is a huge punishment we must remember that uh, humans both men and women have a brain and it's those are equal brains in the sense that the brain of a woman doesn't look different way different or you know doesn't have different functions than the brain of a man and if a woman's function was only reproduction and home care then she would have the reproductive body parts and have a much smaller brain she doesn't need to have a brain that is capable of rocket science and mathematics and a body that is capable of doing extraordinary functions right so uh, human beings have been created have evolved in a way that both genders carry talent right both genders are capable of delivering astonishing results you know as far as intellectual capacity is concerned as far as physical capacity is concerned physically women are very very strong right they can carry weights they carry a baby for 9 months they can carry weights uh, that are far greater than themselves you should see women working in the mountain women working in the fields from day to night women work in the fields they bend down it's not the men who work right it's the women who work that are doing that physical labor so uh, i think we should definitely stop pretending that there are singular roles for human beings and it is just outright boring to be confined to that singular role everybody needs a break even if you're doing the most amazing job intellectually engrossing the job that you love you will get bored and burn out after a while everybody wants to take a break right the same goes for women getting up every morning and cooking and cleaning is extremely boring and a total waste of human potential if we use that human potential the gdp of india would tremendously grow the human development indices of india would be very high and people would be much happier in general um so what what are your experiences as a feminist mom uh what are some turning points 
what are the uh, what are some of the initiatives you have taken and which have been successful could you please uh, tell us about them i think uh, you know two of the biggest uh, things uh, that uh, you know are my realization is that one um, people constantly underestimate women right um, it is goes back to what you say the stereotype is such that you can bring a lot to the table but most of the people around the table think the lesser of you for the same way that you can hold a phd and you know a society or the family may think that your uh, cooking and cleaning and you know reproduction comes first that is a gross underestimation of women's talent um and the fact that patriarchy exists everywhere in the world tells you that it is a because of the reproductive function there is a deliberate and constant underestimation of women's talent so every table that you go to very very often uh especially by men you get underestimated so it's something to be aware of which means that you have to work much harder to prove your talent and prove yourself and there isn't an automatic acceptance and yes it is very unfair but it helps women to be aware of that it helps men to be aware of that if you have a man and a woman at the table stop pretending that you know he is inherently more capable or you know brings more to the table the second thing is awareness i think we cannot do enough to create awareness right there is extraordinary amount of awareness like you rightly pointed out with students with schools with uh, uh, you know men in general today i saw a facebook post where i was tagged and the post is about uh, uh, mobility about urban mobility and transport buses trains metro things like that nothing to do with feminism you would think you would think it has nothing to do with feminism the post is about making sure the government invests more in suburban trains you know in sustainable transport in the post is uh, and it's a group of people that have worked together to make this happen including me right that we have all contributed to uh, asking the government to invest in transport now the post is about that and there is a comment on the post that says the the government is not investing enough in suburban trains but it is investing too much in the metro the metro is like a costly girlfriend while the suburban train is like the poor hard working wife okay this is coming from a mobility activist someone who's highly educated who works for the city right and there is absolutely no need to bring women into this and this is a highly sexist comment right it's a sexist comment on so many angles the point is not that such comments get made yes they are made everywhere the point is that of all the people who have liked the post who have read the post read the comments not a single man has objected to it i'm just waiting and watching at some point i'm going to object to it but i'm waiting to see if all the male friends i worked with anybody will object to it and say that this is an inappropriate comment why what what's the connection between girlfriend and wife why are you putting down one woman you know to and what is the connection to a train right so the reason i bring this up is to say that in our lives uh the best thing we can do when we see people being put down in inequality right is to call it out each and every nothing else just call it out and say hey that's not right what you're saying you know so i think that's a change that needs to happen that's something that i realized for myself but that's a change that needs to happen in everybody man or woman right if you're going if your friend is insulted if you're going to call it out then it's very important for you to call it out when someone else is insulted because of their caste or gender or anything because they may be you know less well off than you for any reason less educated right maybe rural maybe doesn't speak english well right people get uh, you know insulted for that and it's not right and we need to call this kind of casual sexism builds up and becomes misogyny right and then becomes sometimes you know crimes against women or violence against women so calling out if you see a woman being hit or a woman being spoken ill of or being a denied an opportunity i think is very important and this is a social malaise so social disease it's not a disease it's not a women's issue in fact it's a men's issue um what are your views about a uh, 50% reservation for women ma'am uh, what can we do to make it possible 
I mean, I think because women are half the population uh, in India, which is a representative democracy, women must have the right to represent themselves. See, we must, uh, you know, people ask questions like, you know, oh, but we had Indira Gandhi and oh, we had, uh, we have Mamta, is that not enough? No, one woman here and one woman there is not enough. That's like saying, I sent two girls to school, why should I send the rest of the girls to school, right? Uh, each woman needs to be educated. Each woman needs to have an opportunity to make a life for herself, whether she wants to ba be a banker or a farmer, whether she wants to be a policewoman or a politician. Um, and the country deserves women's thoughts, women's ideas on policies, women's input on laws and policies for the laws and policies themselves to be balanced. And that is only possible if we promote women in politics, right? And if we don't promote women in politics, which is what we are doing today, then we are forced to ask for reservation, to say half the parliament, half is us, half should be ours. In fact, that is Shakti's campaign. The campaign itself is called Adeham Adha Hamara. Half is us, half is us, right? Um, so unfortunately, the, the uh, you know, constitution has some... Uh, uh, limits on, you know, how reservation can be uh, implemented. For example, 17% reservation given to SCSTs. So the total reservation cannot exceed 50%. There are some nuances that need to be taken care of, right? But nobody is saying only one third should be women. I think it is because of those nuances that comes to one third. What people are saying is there must be a critical mass of every kind of demographic. Since there are a lot of farmers, Farmers should be represented in parliament and in assembly. A lot of women, women should be represented. If you're a state like Goa that has a huge coast, a lot of fishing population must be represented. If you have a lot of business population in Maharashtra, they must be represented, right? Any demographic has a right to be represented, aggregate and to be represented. And we must realize that women's lives are significantly different than men's lives in this country. Women have the kind of pressures in personal life. Women face the kind of obstacles in public life that are incomparable to what a man, what men face. I just gave you an example of a Facebook post. These are the kinds of things that women see every day. Men don't see it at all. They are, they are making such comments and they are, you know, they, they, it doesn't bother them to make these comments. If these things need to be fixed, women need to speak up. Women need to speak up publicly and women need to be able to make laws and policies to fix them which is the reason we need a critical mass of women, 50% would be ideal. 50% is our right. Um, so what, um, what would you say to parents discouraging their girl children to pursue a political career? Great question. Um, politics is dirty in our country. We, we have to accept that. Politics is also extremely misogynistic in our country. It's a highly patriot, it's the epitome of a patriarchal space. And women are treated very, very poorly in politics. And this is why you see women from political families join politics much more because the family network offers a certain safety, right? If you're related to some politician, you're less likely to be harassed. You're less likely to be spoken ill of, less likely to be uh, uh, you know, treated poorly. So we must, first of all, admit that politics is a hostile space for women. And this is why parents naturally, uh, you know, hesitate to encourage women and girls to join politics. But what I would remind you is this. The only way to clean up that space is to actually occupy that space. The street full of a market, uh, a market street, full of street vendors and women on the street and women selling things and women shopkeepers is the safest street for other women to go to. A bank where lots of women are working is much safer than an industry where there are very, very few women on the shop floor. So how do you fix the industry? Not by not sending women, not by discouraging women, by well, actually putting more women there. Yeah, by occupying that space. Every space that women occupy becomes safer for women. So the way to make politics better, safer, healthier, and actually more productive for the country is for more and more women to occupy it. So I would say that more and more parents should encourage more and more girls to get into politics. And the more we get into politics in a critical mass, the cleaner politics will be. In fact, the way we should think is like this. Look around you. For 70 years now, the only common thing is not the parties that have been ruling. Parties have changed. You've had coalition governments, right? Parties have changed. 
parties have changed in every state parties have changed in the country right but fundamental things are broken water electricity basic dignity lack of toilets after swachh bharat you still have a lack of toilets men are still peeing on the street right so now the only commonality is that no matter what the party no matter what the agenda 90% of the governance has been by men 90% of the mlas mps are men imagine if 50% were women the society might look completely different progress might have been completely different not if there is one woman not if there are two women but if there is 50% women in critical mass right so what i would say to parents is the reason that it is unsafe itself is because of lack of women so send more women in and also remember that women are going to clean it up and bring you much bigger gov much better governance be not because we are more talented simply because we bring a completely different viewpoint and the male and the female viewpoint put together will make for a much more balanced progressive governance yes uh one uh, two is better than one and uh, if we keep if we shake hands if we um together hands. work um yeah. it can make a bigger difference yeah absolutely we can accomplish more so what do you think are the um, problems women are facing in the political field um is I it only misogyny the... or uh, um is misogyny the no. main cause or uh, what do you think i mean uh, patriarchy is the cause but misogyny is just one symptom of it the biggest problem women face in politics is um they are not given an opportunity to perform if you look at political parties even though many political parties have thousands or lakhs of women they are not given the opportunity to be district leaders constituency leaders uh, head up the committees be general secretaries uh, lead the candidate selection committees so the they are not promoted they are not given opportunities to prove themselves if you don't uh, you know if you're not a city leader or district leader or a constituency leader you cannot develop that you cannot develop a political base you cannot show yourself as a leader if you if you don't become a leader then you cannot stand for election and win an election if you're never given a ticket to win and uh, to stand for election you can never stand for election independents don't win in india men or women independents are not elected you must belong to a party and stand on a party platform so i think the biggest barrier for women are political parties which don't give them the opportunities to perform opportunities to lead opportunities to run an office and opportunities to run for office opportunities to stand for election and perform so finally what is your message to the young generation people who are going to become um future um political leaders or uh, feminists or anybody else what is your uh, message to the youth ma'am my message would be two things one is uh, the best leadership quality i have seen isn't the oratorical ability to you know make grand speeches isn't the ability to understand deep laws and policies um, isn't the ability to appeal to people and garner lots of followers um the reason i say that is because they've been hitler was one of the best speakers on the planet okay so the best orators don't necessarily make for the best leaders uh if you cater to people and say the worst things then uh, you are likely to have a lot of followers if you cater to the stereotypes if you reinforce the worst of the regressive beliefs about caste or about gender you're likely to have a lot of followers again that doesn't make you a great leader um similarly understanding law and policy is important necessary but it's not sufficient to be a great leader what is important to be a great leader you can have all these qualities but what is important to be a great leader is to have a heart is to care about people is to have some empathy right and genuinely want to alleviate suffering so even as you you know try to build your other leadership qualities open your eyes to where people are being discriminated against people are being treated unfairly where people don't have enough where people are suffering and genuinely try to you know be aware and help that situation second is in your own sphere stop accepting uh inequality harassment molestation you should have a zero tolerance to sexism right that doesn't mean you need to pick up a fight it can be as simple as somebody posts a nasty message in a whatsapp group that puts down women you say hey i don't appreciate this message 
surely this can be said without bringing sexism in you know think about how you would respond think ahead of time how you would respond because every day you're hearing these things right what you can do personally makes you a better human being right and also sets an example for others there is a way to lead and take everyone along right that's the way we want to choose not a way that excludes people a way that includes people takes everyone along with a goal to saying that the last person in the line the least privileged person should benefit from your leadership so um, thank you so much ma'am for your time and your valuable insights about uh, how we can um, make this world a better place for uh, our equals women um what i would say is that um to my peers people of my age and people uh, children and the youth um please stop encouraging stereotypes and go against the tide start um discouraging um women harassment and misogyny and start working towards the equality of both genders uh so thank you so much ma'am thank you it's a uh, lovely speaking to you and it's amazing to see young people like yourself uh you know take up this a particular topic and mantle i think the best change for gender equality can will only come from men uh because you know women want to be equal but it is not their choice right power today in society for whatever reason is held by men and unless men come forward and change themselves and change patriarchy because you have the power to make the change doesn't mean women aren't patriarchal it means women have the power to make you men have the power to make the change so thank you for spearheading this and i hope more and more boys and men follow in your uh, footsteps thank you ma'am good day to you bye